Could the inscriptions of the Dome of the Rock have survived the first five centuries of its existence? Earthquakes, structural collapse, the Crusaders, etc.? We're discussing A.G. Deuce's extensive research into this question. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you back to a continuation of this fascinating series about the Dome of the Rock in, spec, uh, in inscriptions and uh, the dating of those inscriptions. Of course, uh, we have had the privilege of uh, having uh, Mel, uh, uh, our dear brother and friend here, uh, who always does an excellent job researching matters related to the historical criticism of Islam, and it's no exception here. And uh, he is basing uh, uh, these facts that we're sharing with you on an article or academic article, if you wish, published uh, recently uh, and written by uh, someone by the name of A.G. Deuce. And the argument that uh, A.G. Deuce makes is that uh, he have enough evidence to support the notion that those inscriptions would have been 16th century inscriptions as opposed to uh, the common understanding that they were a 7th century or even uh, 8th century, if you wish. So that's why we are trying to present one such view and bring it to the forefront because, you know, uh, one way or another, some people are going to be exposed to that article and we'd like to really be uh, among the pioneers to bring those kind of uh, information uh, to your attention. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we want to welcome uh, our friend and uh, uh, our colleague here, Mel, who is joining us virtually. Mel, again, thank you so much for being here. Great to be back. Um, so today we're going to be looking at uh, two things, really. First, the issue of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the fact that it wasn't always in the same location. A lot, a lot of the time people assume that the current location is the the location it's always been in. And the other thing that we're going to look at is why the inscriptions wouldn't survive the first uh, five centuries. So if we look at the picture um, that I have on, on the screen, we can see the position of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in 978 AD, and it's that red rectangle. So it's way off in the corner, whereas to the left, you can see the building, which is where the Al-Aqsa is today. So that's just one example of how buildings got destroyed, got repaired, got built. And this strengthens the case for the idea that same would have happened with the Dome of the Rock. Over the centuries, it would have got damaged. It would have had fires, earthquakes and so forth, and then be rebuilt. Um, the inscriptions are on the inner arcade, um, and that is kind of like the skeleton of the building. It is the buttresses that hold up the entire building. If anything got damaged with the building, the arcades would definitely have been affected by that. And that's one of the reasons why um, AJ Juice has brought this up. Now, um, so first of all, we look at the reason why we know that um, the Al-Aqsa today is a completely different building to the one in 978. Um, he refers to the following, another description from 978 AD by Ibn Hockel and Ishtakbri provides more details about the Dome of the Rock. Um, the key bit there is the main building, supposedly the Aqsa Mosque, occupies the southeastern angle of the mosque and covers about half the breadth of the same. The remainder of the harem area is left free and is nowhere built over. And it also says that at this place there has been a raised stone, like a platform of great unhewn blocks, in the centre of which, covering the rock, is a magnificent dome. So we have here evidence for the Dome of the Rock, and also that the Al-Aqsa Mosque was in a different location at that time, and a, a far larger building at that time. There's also this additional note. The Persian traveller Nasir e Husro visits Jerusalem in the spring of 1147. He's the last to mention the mosque on the Temple Mount to be attached to the Eastern Wall. 25 years later, it would be reported as being at the south. This is primary evidence that the Al-Aqsa Mosque did not exist at its current place until at least the mid 12th century. Now, late 10th century, earthquakes threw down most of the main building. Okay, so this is highly significant. Um, the first report outside of earlier tradition that claims Almanac's involvement emerges 
with the late 10th century geographer al Mukaddazi. And the, the key bit there is that he says, this mosque is even more beautiful than that of Damascus, for during the building of it, they had for arrival and as a comparison, the great church belonging to the Christians at Jerusalem, and they built this to be even more magnificent than the other. But in the days of the Abbasids occurred the earthquakes, which threw down most of the main building, all in fact, except the portion around the Mirab. Now, if if that witness account is correct, if, if an earthquake threw down most of the building, that would mean that at the very least, at least some of the arcade, if not all of the arcade, would have been damaged. I think that's a reasonable suggestion. And so therefore the inscriptions would have been damaged. And yet the inscriptions we have today are without a blemish. And I think AJ Juice makes a very good case here why the the inscriptions couldn't have been from the 7th century as a result of this eyewitness account. Now, can you imagine a scenario where most of the building was thrown down, yet the arcade with its inscriptions survived unscathed? So you can imagine there's a downward force. The arcades have been pushed one way, they've been pushed another way. Um, this would have put an awful lot of force on that vertical line there, which is where the arcade is and where the, the inscriptions are. It's hard to imagine that there wouldn't at least be a crack in them, and yet nothing of that nature is there. Now, we also can turn to Al-Wasiti. In 1019, 1020, the preacher of the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Tilpa Mount produced a detailed account of Al-Malik's involvement. He says, when Abdul Al-Malik wanted to build the Dome of the Rock, it came from Damascus to Jerusalem. He then sent to all his deputies in all his dominions, he wrote, Abdel Malik plans to build a dome over the rock to shelter the Muslims from cold and heat and to construct the masjid. Now, E.J. Juice would argue that, considering what we know that went before all of this, all the evidence we've looked at, that this is just an example of a narrative that's been written to backdate a much later dome of the rock and give it, uh, or to place it at a time that was... Um, more appropriate for the narrative that they're trying to build. It goes on to say, they informed him that the sum of 100,000 dinars was left from the money he allocated. He offered it to them as a reward, but they declined, indicating that they had already been generously compensated. Abdul al-Malik then ordered that the gold coins be melted and cast on the exterior of the dome, which then so glittered that no one could look straight into it. Now, the, the problem is that down through the centuries, we see various accounts of the Dome of the Rock being, sometimes it is with gold on the outside, sometimes it's just lead. Um, that would indicate that massive changes have occurred to the Dome of the Rock over the centuries. Now, right. if we go further, A.J. Juice says, there is no need to pretend that this is anything other than a fairy tale. His account bears no credibility whatsoever. The oral chain of transmission that spans over 300 years is just as spurious as the text itself. So he basically says it's too self-congratulatory to be realistic or, or convincing. Uh, so it's basically, it's a narrative designed to fool people into thinking that the Dome of the Rock that now exists was from the time of Abdul al-Malik. Al Mukaddazi in the late 10th century describes it as being decorated with mosaics at that time, but makes no mention of any inscriptions. And the question is why? And then we have the following Why would Al Muhalabi and Eutysius report that Walid built the Dome of the Rock if the inscriptions said otherwise? Yeah. And so the also, very existence of multiple accounts is damaging in and of itself. That's what he's saying. Absolutely. So the fact that, as, you, as we'll see further on, that when you ask someone who built the Dome of the Rock, they keep changing their idea of who it is. Sometimes they say Umar. Sometimes they say it's Walid, Abdel Malik. You know, take your pick. If there was an inscription in the Dome of the Rock, then it would have been clarified, but there doesn't seem to be any clarification yet. Um, 
Al Wasiti is again transmitting older traditions. Um, during the time of Abdul Al Malik, there was hanging on the chain above the rock under the dome, Yatima pearl, the horns of Abraham's ram, and the crown of Husro. Now, what's interesting is he doesn't mention the inscription. You would have thought that in mentioning what was hanging inside the dome of the rock, he mentions things that are not really that important, but he misses the inscription. So that's another piece of evidence. And then, as we mentioned in an earlier episode, if that weren't bad enough, the Temple Mount was under crusade or control for two centuries. Are we expected to believe the inscriptions, had they existed, would have survived that? Um, under the patronage of Saladin, um, Imad Adin describes the interior of the Dome of the Rock, on leaving the presence of mosaics and inscriptions out. They had adorned it with images and statues, set up dwellings there for monks, and made it the place for the gospel, which they venerated and exalted to the heights. Over the place of the prophet's holy foot, they set an ornamented tabernacle with columns of marble, marking it as the place where the Messiah had set his foot, a holy and exalted place where flocks of animals, among which I saw species of pig, were carved um, in marble. Now, he's talking about the Crusaders. Now, why did the Crusaders put sculptures of pigs in the Dome of the Rock? I would argue that they did that because it was an anti-Muslim sentiment. Of course, of course. they, they want to uh, desecrate it, basically. So why stop there? Why not destroy the inscriptions had they existed? Especially when the Pope had uh, given instructions that if, if there was a memorial to Muhammad, um, that they would be excommunicated. So they were very clear in their minds that um, that that wasn't acceptable. So if they saw it on the wall, they would surely have destroyed it. I think AJ Juice makes a really strong argument on this point, at least. And two inscriptions attest to the dome's restoration after an earthquake in 1015, 1016. The biggest threat to the notion that inscriptions and mosaics could have survived from the 7th century until today was an earthquake in 1015 AD that caused the dome to fall onto the enshrined rock. Two inscriptions attest to the restoration of the collapsed dome in 1022-23. Um, it's hard to imagine that the, the dome could collapse and not damage the arcades which support the dome. That's the right. two of them are kind of go hand in hand together. The arcades are holding up the roof, which is supporting the dome. So if the dome goes, the roof goes, and therefore the arcades go. Um, anyone who's ever played dominoes and knocked one domino against another would clearly see that it's so unlikely that if the dome came off that the arcades would have survived. So today's arcades with inscriptions rest on columns that had been replaced after the earlier ones. The descriptions of the time are markedly different from the modern appearance. While, while the main walls appear to be the same with exact measurements, the arrangement of the inner supporting columns is so different that another destructive event must have consumed weaker parts of the structure. So the number of columns has changed over the centuries, which is an indication, indication that um, there was a, a rebuild of the arcades over the centuries. So these columns here were, were replaced. And I think I may have left out some information. Oh, here it is. So there originally were eight inner supporting columns and 24 outer columns. The 24 outer ones are what supports the arcades, the key ones. But they then were replaced with 12 inner supporting columns and 16 outer columns. So that would indicate a significant change. You can't just change the columns without damaging the arcades and the inscriptions above. And finally, indeed, just a few years later in 1033 AD, multiple earthquakes hit the area and caused mass ca casualties. The outer wall of the Haram area was thrown down. Yet we are to believe that the mosaics and the inscriptions survived unscathed. I think AJ Juice makes a really strong case. When you take it all into account, all of the different mishaps, the earthquakes, the fires and so on, and even the fact that the Crusaders occupied the site for two centuries, it's highly unlikely that inscriptions would have survived all of that. So hand it back to you. 
Amen. Thank you so much, brother. I think we have at least two more uh, parts, if I recall, uh, to finish this particular series, but I hope everyone is finding it to be uh, fascinating and uh, that the argument I thought that A.G. Deuce is making really, um, uh, I mean, are very strong arguments, at least, uh, even if uh, you have a way to refute them, it's obviously very logical to at least present and bring to the forefront. So I'm excited about this uh, public debate that is taking place and also uh, the fact that uh, this claim uh, is being examined seriously. And, uh, you know, for all that, uh, uh, you know, uh, all that matter, I should say, is that, as I mentioned many times, there are ample evidence to indicate later developments in Islamic history. And therefore, it's damaging to just Islam in and of itself when it started it. And when a number of its monuments were built, uh, a number of its uh, basically milestones were established, a number of uh, its own, um, uh, you know, primary sources uh, were collected, and the list can go on and on and on. As always, thank you, Mel. Thank you, everyone. This is Al Fadi. Over and out. God bless. Take care. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.